Cool. So, welcome to our talk, uh, where we are going to explore an interesting field, which is called digital forensics. And especially uh, a technique that is going to revolutionize this field, which is called container checkpointing. So, a little bit about us. I'm Daniel Simeonato. I'm currently a technical marketing manager at SysDig, but I have a past in uh, site reliability engineering. And I'm Javier Martinez. I'm a software engineer currently based in Zaragoza, and I have a, well, a background in, in e-commerce, currently working as a freelance. So what is this uh, digital forensics that we're talking about? Well, uh, this is a, basically a process that is about retrieving, analyzing, and preserving electronic data. But uh, related with criminal activity, in the sense of we want to uh, cats whenever there's a criminal activity happening in our digital elements, but also as well retrieving this evidence that should be enough proof that the crime has been, has been committed. Additionally, you might have heard the term the fear, which is a wider area, which is digital forensics and incident response. So it's uh, this incident response as well about how do you react to these kind of uh, attacks, right? And how to improve in a similar way to DevOps. There's uh, a loop where you need to iterate and try to uh, respond better in case any of these incidents happen. And at this point, you might be thinking, okay, but this might be interesting for secure companies or this might be interesting for, you know, um, ap applications that, ha that uh, treat very sensitive data. But chances are that you're running applications in the cloud. So right now, if you, if you heard about Pablo's uh, previous uh, talk, he mentioned that you know, crypto jacking, uh, malware, ransomware, you know, they are uh, running wild. And as I said, if you're running something in the cloud, chances are that someone wants to run an application there and, and for example, start mining cryptos. Uh, since Pablo as well talked about the, how Falco is the, the webcam, for any, sorry, the surveillance camera for any criminal activity. I'm going to talk about the, the cordoning or, you know, preserving the crime scene. Uh, do you feel familiar with this image if you have seen some uh, TV shows or movies about crime? So, do you know, can anyone tell me what's the point of, you know, for example, try to put a cordon around the area with crime scene or putting these kind of flags? Anyone? Guesses? Probably you know. Come on, let me show you. Evidence. evidence. Okay. Okay. Try try to locate where's where's the evidence, right? And try to try. Exactly. No one no one is stepping in and probably uh, breaking or or try to tamper or uh, imagine that this uh, completely ruins the the evidence. Not only that, the people who is finding the criminal activity might not be the same people who is going to investigate it. And that's interesting. If you've seen this in movies as well, they're waiting for the forensic team and they're going to analyze based on this. And this is why container checkpointing is important. Okay, this is working again. <laughs> so container checkpointing is a technique that is used to save the current container state. Uh, you can think of this as a, as a snapshot, right? It's going to take the uh, current snapshot of what's the, the state of the container or you can think of it as a backup. But in the end, we can find an analogy if you're playing video games, like it's like saving my, my game, right? And of course, I can load it at a different time. So this effectively, in case that there's a criminal attack happening, I could save this in order to retrieve these uh, as, as criminal evidence, right? So you can, see, you can see why container checkpointing could be a very interesting technique for this. And Basically, this would be the summary. Investigate a container, retrieve criminal evidence, and finally, do that while the attacker is unaware, right? We can do that and because if he or she is unaware, they can quickly remove any traces and such. And this could be a, a graphic, you can see it. There's a, an attack happening and there's a container being affected and quickly we can create this uh, checkpoint, right? And we can start retrieving information on the commands that has been run, or files modifies, or the attacker path, etc. We're going to see it right away, but first. So, container checkpointing 
It all started with Cryo. Cryo is a project uh, that started uh, as a proof of concept uh, from Virtuoso in 2011 and uh, reached the 1.0 version uh, in November 2013, where the first uh, uh, patches got merged uh, in Linux kernel 3.11. So what does it mean, Cryo? It means uh, container uh, checkpoint and restore in user space. Uh, the use case in uh, Virtuoso was uh, live migration of containers. So stopping a, a container executing on a host, taking a checkpoint, transferring the checkpoint to another host, and spinning it up on the other host. Basically what happens with live migration uh, on a classical VM hypervisor like SAN or VMware, etc., etc. But if you think about it, it's a little bit more complicated in container. Why? Uh, for hypervisor, you have uh, the whole virtual machine is virtual, right? So you have a precise control of the CPU register, of the RAM, of all the memory. The hypervisor has a complete view of everything that is happening. So what happens in live migration, for example, in XEN or QMO, KVM, whatever, is that they start copying, well, the definition of the virtual machine is usually copied immediately, it's just a spec file. Uh, they start copying the memory pages. Of course, memory the pages that gets uh, changed and modified are copied incrementally. Once they have uh, just a small amount of pages left to copy, they freeze the processes they copy the remaining pages, copy the CPU register, and spin up uh, and restart the machine on the other host. This is not possible with container, right? We do not have an hypervisor. Uh, containers, of course, uh, run uh, abstract up to the kernel. And when we live migrate a container, we might run on a different kernel. So what happens? We need to rebuild the whole process tree we need uh, to load the memory pages, and we need to restart uh, uh, the processes. Also applying, for example, uh, security, uh, SE Linux, uh, SecComp, et cetera, et cetera. So it is a bit more complicated. Uh, Virtuosa had uh, um, a solution uh, already, but it was using uh, kernel models. So it had components right in the kernel, and they wanted something in user space that they could also contribute to the main kernel. So the main case, the main uh, use case, and what was it born for was container live migration, but of course we are talking here uh, about digital forensics, so it has multiple use cases. Of course, if you can take an image of a container, so uh, processes running on a system, uh, you have a lot of possibility. We will talk about those later. Um, in the wild, Cryo uh, is used, of course, by OpenVZ, the platform uh, by Virtuoso. It is used in Borg, uh, Google's internal container orchestrator. It is used in uh, Linux containers, so LXC, LXD, exactly for live migration. And it is uh, in recent years, it is also being used in Docker. They added the checkpoint and restore functionality, and lately also in Podman, uh, with the work of uh, Adrian River. So let's see a small demo of a container checkpoint uh, using Podman, actually. So here I have a, uh, okay, the text should be readable. Here I have a, a Ubuntu container running uh, in Podman. It, thank you. Uh, I will exec inside the container. You see uh, the container processes, just a tail on the null to keep it alive. I have this script, which is not part of the base image. If I were to restart the container, I will lose this file. Um, I will now execute this file, and to keep it running, it's just printing uh, the date every second. I will now disconnect from the container, so the script will be kept running, and I will do a checkpoint. So as you can see, there are some options. Uh, you can uh, give Podman while taking the checkpoint. 
uh, we just uh, give uh, the uh, export file, which is a tar.gz file. Uh, there is no standard for container checkpoint yet. There might be in the future. As you can see, there are other options. Uh, by default, uh, Podman stops the container after the checkpoint. So after this is done, uh, we will see that I have no container running on the system. I have my checkpoint, uh, which weighs about uh, 45 megabytes and uh, comprises everything, uh, all uh, the process memory pages, uh, the image, the changed files in the container. Uh, as you can see, I have no container running and I can actually go uh, on and remove the container. So there's no trace of the container on my system right now. I will start the restore. What happens? Uh, Podman will restore uh, the container uh, preserving the exact same container ID. So for example, if you have uh, that container ID uh, bound, I don't know, to a systemd service, you will recover that ID. The container will be uh, running, of course. Uh, if I exit into the container, I can see all the processes are still running and most importantly, they preserve the same process ID. Remember, we uh, reconstructed exactly the same situation. That is why it is useful for um, digital forensics. And as you can see, there's uh, 40 seconds or so that it took uh, for my container to checkpoint and restore where the process did not uh, print the date. So there's that, and um, back to you, Javier. Oops, now we're talking. Cool. And luckily, we have seen when we have seen Podman in action with checkpointing. But luckily, Kubernetes as well has checkpointing uh, feature uh, since version 1.25, uh, where this was graduated as, as alpha. And it's uh, actually based on Cryo, uh, as uh, well the the tool that, that Daniel showed. And we can see that currently the, we only have the checkpointing. Uh, uh, out of the box for, for, for Kubernetes. We don't have a still restore. With our analogy, it's like we are able to save our games, but we are not able to load our games yet, okay? But we will see that we have other, other ways to pass this. And this will be the, the, the procedure to, to create a checkpoint in, in Kubernetes. We can call the kubelet API as, at a slash uh, uh, checkpoint, uh, providing the namespace, the pod, and the container, remember that this uh, checkpoint is done at container level, not pod level. And Kubelet will request uh, a checkpoint which will result, will result in a tar file being created under bar lib uh, Kubelet checkpoints, okay? Once, uh, one, one little mention is that this file will only be available for users with root access, which is as well important because we will see that, that this, this file has a lot you know, on it, okay? Which requirements do we need for, for this to happen? Well, we need to have both Cryo and CryU. We have seen CryU, uh, which is the checkpoint restore in user space, but we need as well Cryo as in the container runtime. Nothing to do any one with the other, but uh, it's, it's easy to, to, to misunderstood, okay? Uh, once again, uh, this is the, the Cryo container runtime that needs to be enabled. And we need to enable it as a feature gate, okay, with the, the usual command. And of course, we need to check that Cryo is enabled, or the support for Cryo is enabled in the Cryo config, okay? And we will see a, a small demo for this later. What will be the output? The output will be a, a tar file, as mentioned, and it will contain an archive of all the change files, as well images of the processes and the, sorry, see, processes, memory, file descriptors, as well some metadata of the, the own file, right, of the, of the tar file that has been created, uh, some bind mounts info for the container, or even some stats and logs. But once again, we're going to see it in action. Okay, so this is a demo of uh, the container checkpointing in Kubernetes. Uh, this is just a, a, an example cluster. I have a, an Nginx pod running on the default namespace. Uh, I will now connect uh, 
to the uh, node where this is running. Uh, remember, the checkpointing API is exposed at the kubelet level for now because of security concerns. Uh, here I'm running uh, an Oracle Linux 8. Uh, here I'm showing that I've enabled uh, cryo support, uh, cryo support in cryo, <laughs> as Javier said. And also, I've uh, enabled the feature gate container checkpoint uh, in the kubelet uh, configuration. Again, this is a feature at the kubelet level. It's not yet at the API server level. Um, one last thing, uh, especially important if you're on Red Hat 8, uh, CentOS 8, or Oracle Linux 8, you need the Cryo version 3.16 or later for this to work. Otherwise, the API will just throw you an error that it needs cryo at a later version. So I just exported a token to authenticate uh, with the uh, kubelet. And here is the call. As you can see, the kubelet answer just with a JSON, uh, with the file path of the uh, checkpoint. And as you can see, here is my checkpoint. Just uh, five megabytes. It is not compressed like the one uh, in Podman, uh, it is just a tar file. There is still no um, uh, specification for the checkpoint uh, um, uh, format, file format. So what can we do with this checkpoint right now? Let's go a bit into digital forensics in practice. In practice. So here I have my, again, my tar file. Uh, there is a tool which is called Checkpoint Control. It reached the version 1.1.0 last week, actually. Uh, it is written in Golang, so you can compile it basically for any architecture. And without uncompressing the checkpoint, you can see you can show some statistics. What was the runtime uh, when it was created? What was the cont uh, container engine, et cetera, et cetera. You can show, for example, the statistics. Here you can see the freezing time of the processes, the time uh, where Cryo stops the processes and starts dumping the memory page was under one milliseconds, so it is uh, quite fast. You can see, for example, the process tree, uh, all the processes that were running in the container at the time we took the checkpoint. And if you do a dash dash hole, you can see all the information available for the processes, uh, which uh, open files every process add, but most importantly, the open sockets. If you see uh, something uh, suspicious in your container, you might have, a, or for example, in uh, uh, Pablo's example, it, it was a, a reverse shell running, uh, exploiting a log for shell, you will see an open socket with the address, right? So you can start investigating what was happening. And you also have all the bind mounts and all the other information available. But it's even cooler. This is all without uncompressing the uh, checkpoint. You can also do a mem parse. So for example, for the PID number one, I can just have a representation of the hexadecimal and ASCII representation of the memory. Um, I can do a tail. This will take a little bit longer for the worker process uh, because it needs to parse all the memory. But you can see that you will find uh, all the information. And that is also why, at the moment, uh, um, the API is still at a, at a kubelet level for security concerns. Of course, if you can uh, output the memory, uh, you can probably read uh, keys, secrets, uh, all the tokens that a process has in memory. So again, it's available only for root users, the checkpoint, and uh, still at the kubelet level. You can do even more. So uh, let's go actually inside the checkpoint and see what's there. Uh, so you don't have to trust us. You see there are some uh, dump files. They are just text files. 
uh, in most of the cases. Here you have a config.dump, uh, here you have a spec.dump. You can see all the configuration of the pod uh, that was uh, checkpointed. You can see the environment variables, uh, the current working directory, the capabilities, the configured one and the effective one uh, at the system level, uh, the path of the volume on the route, et cetera, et cetera, and all the, this information. You can also see the annotations on the pod. Of course, this was taken on cryo, uh, but you can see also uh, Kubernetes annotations on the pod. Um, you, basically, you have every information you need to uh, reconstruct an exact image of the uh, the pod, the container that was checkpointed, and that is uh, crucial when we are talking about forensics and preserving evidence. Uh, of course, you have the bind mounts. There are some limitations uh, in what can be checkpointed, which we'll see later, we'll detail later. You can also have a, a the complete dump log, so you can have uh, all the times uh, that uh, where it took a cryo to dump. What cryo does is basically starts collecting all the information from the proc file system uh, about the processes. Uh, then it does something really tricky, which is uh, saves the code of the process and then injects a parasite code, uh, which acts like a, an interface with the cryo. And from this parasite code, it stops all the processes and start dumping the memory pages. But it is quite quick. Um, there is also this tar file, which is rootfs-diff, which contains all the files that have been written to the container, to the overlay FS, uh, after the container started. For example, uh, you have all these cache directory, of course, that gets created at runtime that are, are not in the base image and that you would lose if you didn't have a container checkpoint. Or, for example, bash history if an attacker uh, didn't disable the history. But, of course, let's go to the interesting part. Inside the checkpoint, you have uh, a lot of uh, EMGs file, files. These are binary files, so not really human readable. Uh, if you were to open one, you would just see mumble binaries for the most part. Um, but actually, uh, Cryo uh, and in Cryo repository, you can find tools uh, that allow you to read. This is, for example, opening a file that allow you to read these binary files. Uh, one of these tools is called Crit. It is distributed with uh, Cryo, or if you install it in packages, you can find uh, in a package. Uh, it is Python-based. It uses uh, uh, Cryo Python bindings. Um, you can, for example, explore a checkpoint directory, and here you see you get the process tree with the, the PIDs, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, you can uh, uh, see, for example, the open file descriptors, and again, you get everything that you checkpointed with the crit, but also you can um, uh, do something similar to the checkpoint control and uh, parse the memory. So for example, uh, opening uh, the memory pages file with crit. Uh, what you can actually do, and we do not show also on the demo, is that uh, there is a script in the Cryo repository, uh, which is, I think it's called Core Dump. Um, maybe it's unfortunate uh, naming, but whatever. You, you can uh, actually convert uh, this image, uh, pages image file into core dumps. Uh, which you can then debug using GDB or whatever other tool uh, you might want to use to analyze all of this. And uh, yeah, here, for example, I'm opening a, a core process image. Uh, 
just the, the field one, and you see you get all the low-level details. This low level you weren't really able to see with the checkpoint control. So if you have a, a really low level investigation going on, uh, probably <coughs> your experts will uh, appreciate having all these details available. And with that, I think we can go ahead. If I can, okay. There you go. Thank you, Daniel. Okay, so we have seen checkpointing in Kubernetes in action, and well, uh, you might be wondering as well, uh, this, I mentioned it earlier, that this needs to happen without the attacker uh, being aware of this happening. And as Daniel said, this happens in a very quick time. I mean, it's like for a second, as I said, this is a snapshot, so it's, it's frozen, but for a very small time, so it's, it's, it's not noticeable by the attacker. And as well, there's no interference with the running processes, which is also very, very important. Additionally, uh, we haven't talked as well, we have uh, the, the availability of, of restoring, which is the, the opposite. It's like we have a, a checkpoint available and we can load it in a controlled uh, container, like a sandbox. Uh, this is useful, for example, once again, for the, for the investigation to happen, but we will see as well that there are multiple uh, other uses for, for checkpointing slash restoring. Um, once again, I mean, restoring is not available in Kubernetes, so you will need to use Podman and uh, CryCTL, as it said. And in case that you want this in, in Kubernetes, there is the possibility that you can build an image using Builder, which is a, a tool that you can, based on the checkpoint, you can create uh, an image. It has some limitations of course, that we are going to uh, summarize. Uh, of course, not everything can be checkpointed. You have seen that this is quite a thorough list, and when I, when I mentioned that this is related with the container state, but things that are not going to be checkpointed, for example, are the devices, or open files from unmounted uh, file systems, or even uh, processes that they are already being traced. These are not, going to, are not going to happen, so it has some limitations. And as well, Kubernetes checkpoints has limitation of, of, of its own. Uh, first, we have seen that cryo has to be enabled. For example, if you're running uh, EKS uh, uh, in AWS, this, uh, the, the runtime is not cryo, so you're not be able to do. Uh, you need, uh, as well, cryo version uh, 3.16 or higher. And there are some security concerns, as you have seen, that the dump contains all the full memory, right, uh, raw, so you might be exposed by, I mean, the, the, the whole file could be as well uh, prone to, to leaking some important data. And of course, if you're using container D, there's no current support. I mentioned as well that this uh, talk is focused on the um, digital forensics, but of course, the sky is limit when talking about the, the usages because we can use it, for example, to, to backups. We can talk, you know, Cryo was used as well for uh, container live migration, or we can use it even to uh, reproduce problems that are happening in production. We can take it a snapshot and we can reproduce in a more controlled environment or a sandbox, once again. And we can use it to, for, to hot start applications that are critical, right? So because we are uh, basically um, loading our game in, our, in, our, in the best spot, so to say. And I want, I want to, to recap what we have seen in uh, today's talk. First, the checkpoint uh, it can be crucial for digital forensics and incident response, uh, as well that this is, a, so to say, a snapshot. This is a, um, it's a, an image of a frozen time, a frozen moment for the container. Uh, this is available in Kubernetes only for checkpointing. Restore is not available. And beware of the requirements because we have seen that we have both Kubernetes requirement and both cryo requirements. So these are some of the sources uh, which you can get in the presentation. Uh, there are a couple of uh, Kubernetes blogs uh, by Adrian Reber, again, from Red Hat. And uh, there's also a talk at uh, KubeCon uh, 2021. Adrian uh, is uh, responsible for 
the PR in the Kubernetes, and also he worked a lot uh, implementing uh, container checkpoint and restore in uh, Podman, for example, and uh, in uh, Cryo. I think he is also working on the Cryo side, but the process is a bit more involved there. And uh, of course, uh, the, um, the PR, where it all started, the uh, API reference, uh, the repository for Cryo and Checkpoint Control, and uh, there is also a SysDig blog by Alberto Pelletieri from the SysDig uh, Threat Research, which uh, explores this functionality uh, in analyzing uh, a malicious container. So with that, thank you for your attention, and if there are any questions, uh, we'll be glad to answer them. Oh, and uh, if you scan the QR code, uh, you can get the repository with the slides and all the files we used for the presentation. And the links from the last.